Uh, thank you, Kevin. Thank you for putting on this event. This was months in preparation and coordination. And uh, the only thing I've done that challenging this year is try and pronounce your last name. So I appreciate it. And thank you for the introduction. Uh, my goal over the next 40 minutes is going to be to present the data that we have so far on the testing optional experiment, as I'll call it. It's been maybe 20 years in the making, and it's been about 10 years since it came of age, more or less, since it was a legitimate option at a number of schools. It was great enough to start doing some research on the impact. But I'll start by introducing myself. My name's Matt LaRiva and I'm the founder of Powerful Prep. We started about 10 years ago as a local Southern California based one man operation. And now we've become an international one on one test prep firm with clients from Laos to the exotic location of Missouri. So in addition to tutoring, I publish quite a bit in different spaces, be it on Quora's forum or in test prep books or in uh, interviews or long form white papers. So these are some of the publications that have come out recently or interviews that I've given. And I don't put these here as sort of uh, credit to myself, but to give you an idea of how much research we've done into this specific area. Most of the quotes that I get and the interviews that I do are specifically around test optional admissions and on Ivy League admissions. So we're very well researched in this area. So I'm happy to be able to present on it. This is what I'd like to cover today. First, we have to figure out what the definition of the test optional goal was. Um, we can't really examine efficacy until we figure out what it intended to be. But then once we do that, we can start to evaluate how has it been in achieving its goals? It's got about 10 years under its belt. We've got some good research studies that have come out around it. Next, we'll talk about the UC decision and how the UCs went from being test required to test blind in the span of about two years and what that taught us about the process overall. Next, I'll move on to the harmful effects as I perceive them or the why do I care about this section. And then last, I've got one slide on alternate methods, things that we might consider as better ways to address this problem, which we definitely agree upon. Uh, but first, a disclosure. This information is my own views. It's not to be associated or conveyed as that of companies that I work for or am affiliated with. That said, uh, what was the goal of test optional? So everybody likely has a soundbite that they reference as why schools wanted to be test optional. And generally it has something to do with diversity or inclusion or access, but it's hard to really find a single summary or agreed upon statement of what schools were trying to do with this trend. So first I wanna clarify, there's sort of two schools here. There's the forced test optional, meaning those who are either legally uh, required to stop looking at tests in the UC's case, or there were those who had to stop looking at tests or make them optional because testing centers closed during the pandemic. So of course you can't require a test that no one was able to take. Those I'm calling the forced test optional. Then you have the intentional test optional. Those are the ones that I'm talking about in the remainder of this presentation. The schools that said, we want to do this because some reason. And what was that reason? It varies, but according to fair test, uh, they have a stated goal of trying to end misuses and flaws of standardized testing and ensure that evaluation of students, teachers, schools, fair, open, valid, educationally beneficial. So it's a really robust, admirable goal. It's also highly qualitative and it's difficult to really evaluate efficacy of. So I'll kind of narrow the focus and say, can we conclude that this policy was effective in ensuring that evaluation was fair or open. Then you have the second school of thought, which is why do schools choose to be testing optional? And I'll excerpt from the University of Chicago here because that is to date the most uh, competitive school that chose to be test optional pre-pandemic or intentionally became test optional. And their mission is a little bit more succinct and a little bit more um, able to be evaluated. And so per their 
uh, release, they wanted to enhance the accessibility of its undergraduate college for first generation and low income students. So that's great. That's a noble goal and we can really check in on how their policies were at doing that. So with that, we can move forward to has it worked? We've got this sort of two stated goals and we can say, did it accomplish this? So has it worked per the fair intent? So a fair test is not a test where everyone scores the same. That's a checklist. A fair test is one which evaluates you relative to your context. And there's a great misattributed Einstein quote about this that says, everyone's a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, then it will live its whole life believing that it's stupid. So the way that fair test purports uh, or supports the evaluation of a student is relative to his context. It's by allowing him to opt out of the test. And that is fair. We agree on that. If you face difficulties that your peers do not, then you should not necessarily be expected to perform at the same level. So if this policy then were effective, what you'd expect to see would be minorities testing less, opting out of a test that's not evaluating them relative to their context. Here's what we actually saw. Minorities tested more. So if you look at 2010, you saw minorities, specifically persons of color, were testing relative to their representation in the broad population with about one to two percentage points over. So they were testing more. Fast forward to 2019, which is where we most recently have data, and you can see that those same groups are testing in summation more frequently. So they're being overrepresented in testing. In fact, from 2010 to 2019, the aggregate fairness, at least by proportional representation, went south toward the opposite end of the spectrum. So there's sort of two ways to look at this. I would say this is fairly conclusive that the test wasn't fair or rather the policy as implemented did not produce a fair outcome. Minorities tested more. Uh, and even though that wasn't the intent, you could probably say that, okay, well, the test then was more open. That was their second goal. So that's perhaps accurate, but openness in testing is really only valuable if those underrepresented populations are benefited by taking the test. So if we're going to have them testing more, even though that wasn't the intent, then they should be able to use this option of test submission to better their chances at admission to schools. So did underrepresented populations submit scores less frequently since the testing optional trend? They did. When given the option, first-generation college students, students of color, women, Pell Grant recipients, which would be low-income students, and students with learning differences are most likely to be those who are non-submitting applicants. So that's great. Even though they're testing more, they're not submitting, which presumably means that they're making this choice for themselves, whether or not their score would behoove them. But that only is really helpful if they're then getting admitted to schools more. So did they get admitted more? The research says they did not. Enrollment in students of color did not increase. Uh, throughout the presentation, I'm using superscripts after the quotes, and that's not to give them qualifiers, that's to provide sources. So feel free to look those up or I can send out the deck. But the point of this, and to be clear, is that this policy had underrepresented students testing more submitting scores less often and seeing no uptick in representation. So it feels like it's safe to say that it has not been a success per fair test stated goals as I'm evaluating them. So we can move on and say, maybe it was a miss there. Maybe it did better per the school's intents. And so did it enhance access for first generation and low income students? So for this section, uh, my sources are going to be peer reviewed research. And normally you wouldn't have to say that in an academic context, but there's so much anecdotal survey data out there that I think it's worth mentioning. 
And to be clear, there haven't been many studies into this area, not many peer-reviewed studies, um, but it is gaining traction. You are getting a little bit more and more. And what else is interesting is that the studies that we do have are pretty consistent with one another. So the first study was in the American Educational Research Journal, its conclusion, the impact of test optional is marginally effective. And when they say marginally, they really mean it, about a one percentage point increase in absolute terms of underrepresented minorities and about one percentage point in uh, Pell Grant recipients or um, lower income students. So very marginally effective. The second study, SAT optional policies in the economic letters uh, journal said it was ineffective. Test optional policies have very limited effects, no significant effect on diversity or enrolled student quality, brief increase in number of applicants. So then we see that there's really little to no impact of the test optional policies on school admissions. Uh, so we can pretty confidently say that there's not a really strong case to be made that it's working per the school's stated goals. But the counterpoint is, is there anything wrong with it? Even a marginal increase is arguably a better one. So we have to sort of examine the other side. Is there anything that we lost in the implementation of these policies? And the short answer is yes, of course there is. That's how unintended consequences work. You can't pull a pillar out of the base of the admissions process and expect that nothing will change with it. The problem is we didn't know where to look. So we're seeing studies come out now that say, here are the downsides that we actually created with this test optional experiment. One is enhanced selectivity. The reason being students with uh, lower scores are less likely to submit to these schools, which means the scores that these schools have to report on are generally going to be skewed higher. Higher scores factors into a school's US News and World rankings, which in many cases creates enhanced selectivity in that institution. So this policy that was aimed at increasing access is having quite the opposite effects by creating a more selective institution. The last study I wanna reference here is that, uh, uh, that of one that was in SSRN fairly recently and its conclusion was actually polar opposite from what the intended policies were. And they found that because test optional seeking students had fewer schools to apply to, those schools were being more competitive in terms of their pricing and those graduates who applied and were admitted had to actually spend more to go to those schools if they didn't submit a test. So per peer reviewed literature that's formally studied this trend, not only is there really no positive impact, but there's actually accidental negative impacts. And you'll say to yourself, how can this be? We see at least once a week, an article about a school that's decided to go test optional, a school that has gone test optional and seen a increase or a benefit. And inevitably when I talk about this, people will say, but this school went test optional and now they have a more diverse class, right? The policy must be working. And to that, I think it's important to understand that correlation is not causation. Things that happen at the same time do not necessarily cause each other. And there's an entire website devoted to this called spurious correlation, which is what it's known as in statistical uh, context. And they just list all of these things that have ultra high correlations with one another, but obviously have nothing to do with one another. If correlation meant causation, then we could start to really decrease venomous spider deaths by just shortening spelling bee words. But of course that's ludicrous. So you can't evaluate these things just because they're temporally coincident. The reason is in more intuitive terms, Schools adopt test optional policies as part of a broad effort to become more diverse. No school has ever said, we're going to try and become more diverse by making tests optional and we're going to do nothing else and we're not going to talk about it. That's what you'd need to really make a good comparison. But of course, they're all doing this as part of a broad effort. 
presumably there are some other things that they're doing besides making tests optional that are contributing to a more diverse class. So how do you know what portion of that diversity is attributable to test optional policies and what portion is attributable to other efforts? Well, the best we can do is to look at the peer reviewed research. Skip the anecdotal research. There are always going to be surveys that say, and one came out last week in uh, Inside Higher Ed, 250 schools surveyed, and they believe that the policy has led to a more diverse class. How would they know? What other efforts were they making? How do you distill out? You don't as an individual, right? That's why we have peer reviewed research that does all these statistical normalizations. And it comes from groups that have no vested interest in the success or failure of the policy. So again, it's worth repeating, correlation isn't causation. So when you hear about these schools that are doing better because of test optional policies, you should meet that with a healthy dose of skepticism. If it weren't the case, then we could solve all marriages in Maine by decreasing butter consumption. So the point of the whole first section up to here is fairly simple. Whatever the goal of the test optional trend was, however we want to define it, it's not working. In fact, according to the best research we have on the topic right now, not only is it not working, but it's harmful in unexpected ways that we can't fix because we don't know where to look. So that said, I want to shift now to a case study. And this specifically focuses on the universities of California. And I call this a case study in chaos. The picture below is what happened after a water main ruptured on UCLA's campus a few years ago. And it feels to me surprisingly apt for the situation because I feel like this guy at the right is sort of like the UC system and he's got his shoes off and he's sort of just like in the mire of this situation but his hands are in his pockets and he kind of doesn't know what to do. He gets it, there's an issue, but he's sort of at a loss. And then in the bottom left, you have what I perceive to be fairtest.org. You have this group who's sort of like trying to uh, move the needle and they're doing something and they're really, you know, obvious about it, but I'm not sure if he's vacuuming the floor or if he's trying to buffer it, but it might be doing more harm than good. So I'll run through what happened in the universities of California. It starts in July of 2018. Uh, then President Napolitano said that she wanted to examine the current use of standardized testing for UC admission, presumably for all the reason that test optional gets instituted. Are they using them effectively? Do the policies need to change? So that was July of 2018. January of 2019, the Academic Council Standardized Testing Task Force was formed. So a year later, typical of the California government, they form a committee. What's noteworthy here is that the committee was formed of 18 different professors from the UC schools. So this is not just a community-based survey, right? They had their own professors who are experts in fields from law to social studies, to public health, to education, review the test policy. January of 2020, they conclude their year-long research into all of the different UC campuses the faults of the tests, which we all know about, and the benefits from submitting them. And their conclusion was, don't make standardized tests optional for applicants. Any change that they made would require doing something that the UCs do not know how to do and could conceivably result in greater inequalities and worse student outcomes. So they have the foresight to say, hey, I wonder if making this wholesale change without consolidating or um, trying to couch it in some other processes would cause inequalities. The academic research said it would, it did. They said this might happen to them and they were right. But they concluded that by saying, if changes were mandated immediately and without adequate consultation, you could really get a negative impact. So that was their finding, January of 2020. So what do the regents of the universities of California do? 
Five months later, they vote unanimously to eliminate the SAT and ACT completely. They said that they were going to make their own test starting in 2025, be test optional until then. And you may or may not know the spiral that ensued subsequently. September of 2020, they were sued. They appealed the lawsuit and said they want to be able to at least consider tests, whether or not students submit them is another score. They want to at least consider tests because not doing so would lose a student's ability to put his or her best foot forward. May of 2021, they reach a settlement in court and now they're test blind. So the point of showing that is really twofold. The first powerful takeaway is that the most robust committee of academics ever assembled to study standardized test value found that there was value in the tests and that the consequences to their removal would be unforeseeable. Second, they had to evaluate test blindness because the court mandated it. And they said that that's gonna be a big problem because students with talents, different talents would lose their ability to put the best foot forward. So the UC system, say what you will, did not choose to become test optional or test blind. They were forced into it by the pandemic and then somehow got swept up into it in May, but they weren't going to eliminate tests. They were just going to pivot to their own tests. So a lot of people say the UC system must be doing something right. We can look to them, where goes California, so goes the nation. The UC system did not choose to become test optional for so-called reasons of access or equality. They did so because they were mandated to, and now they're test blind against their wishes. So I want to move to the question of why do we care? Why do I care about this? Why should you? Well, presumably we care about it in this community specifically because we have an economic interest in it. But that's a really bad reason to actually care about something. Most of us got into education because we cared about the students and the student outcomes and making some impact there. So the reason I care about this and presumably the reason you should too is because it's not a test prep issue. This is an education issue and making tests optional under the guise of equality is damaging all of us in some insidious ways. The first problem with eliminating standardized testing is that you lose the only standardized metric of academics that we have. And the knee jerk response to this is, why don't you just look at a student's GPA, right? Don't put a hurdle in their path by requiring a test, just look at their GPAs. And that's a particularly facile argument, which really requires a number of assumptions that are all very vocally disproven by the research. So first, <clears throat> Yes, GPA alone is better than standardized tests alone at predicting college success. But GPA plus test scores is better than either of them. That makes sense. More data is generally more useful in making decisions. But to the original point, GPA alone is not effective by itself because grades are inflating and they're becoming deceptive. Grade inflation is a particular problem because unlike economic inflation, grades have a cap. You can't get higher than an A. So if you would keep inflating, you converge. You don't just move up the scale. Specifically, somewhat anecdotally, the state with the highest GPA actually has one of the lowest graduation rates. And you can cite a number of reasons why that might be but it's weird. More research-based, the last really good study we have on this says among all that um, jargon is that GPAs and grades are not only moving over time, they're moving geographically and they're moving socioeconomically. So there's no standardization of GPAs at all, not in this country. And the result of that 
right? The result of having students admitted purely on inflated GPAs is that students struggle in school and then they drop out of college. One in four of Boston High School's valedictorians failed to graduate college in six years. Boston's known for having a really big grade inflation problem. So this is a pretty succinct address of why GPA isn't sufficient and why evaluating on GPA alone is actually harmful. But there's another reason we shouldn't eliminate standardized tests. And this one's no doubt going to have a negative response at first, but bear with me. Standardized tests are a loan metric that money doesn't move, right? Scores are distributed by income. That's true, but point gains are not. So your starting score is very much correlated with how much money your parents made, but the point gains that you achieve by preparing with a tutor, right? Throwing money at the problem are basically statistically insignificant. They're about 14 to 15 points on the SAT corresponding to about one percentile. And they're zero to 0.7 points on the ACT corresponding to about five percentile points. Now, obviously I run a test prep firm. We publish all of our students' outcomes and we have point gains, but that's anecdotal. By and large, per the research, if you got the, uh, if you got the assistance of a private tutor, you are wasting your money. So test score improvements then become something that money doesn't buy, right? Improvements, not starting scores. So that's to say that someone from a lower economic background is actually on equal footing with someone from a higher economic background because buying a tutor doesn't help. Now contrast that with extracurricular activities, right? Which population is going to have a richer extracurricular profile, wealthy or underprivileged students? Which population is going to have smaller classrooms where the student is more able to form a, re a relationship with the teacher and the teacher can then write the student a really good recommendation letter? probably higher income classrooms, which schools are going to have more access and provide more AP curriculum, higher income schools categorically, which schools and which student base rather is going to be most helped by throwing money at a college counselor for admissions help. Money improves all of those situations. It doesn't improve point gains according to the best research we have on this. So I wanna close this section with the real most insidious problem of the test optional movement. And if I sound frustrated, um, I am, but it's not because test optional as an experiment failed. And it's not really because it actually worsened all the things it hoped to improve. It's because it's a scapegoat and it's a scapegoat that's disguising a really dangerous problem the test optional trend made everyone think that standardized tests were the source of inequality and that their elimination would be a solution. And I draw a parallel from this Twitter post, which we all know to be the bastion of truth. And to torture this metaphor, the standardized tests are the carbon monoxide detector that are telling us that there's a very real weakness in the American education system. But instead of addressing this, the test optional trend decided to take out the batteries so that we don't have to confront the issue. America has one of the lowest performing and most expensive education systems in the world and it's getting worse. Tests report on the state of that demise and they sound an alarm to that cause. And it's a hard problem to address fixing education as a whole, but it's a necessary problem. So if there's one takeaway from this presentation, I hope it's this. Let's not vilify a symptom and forget the cause. So what's a better way to go about this? We all share the same goal. We all want better access to education for underrepresented and overburdened populations. How do you achieve that? 
One way is that you focus on proven methods that are broadly institutable. Government funded preschool would go a really long way at assisting and leveling these playing fields. There's research on it. You can institute it scalably at a high level and it's got a bunch of side benefits, namely GDP growth from a larger workforce as people don't have to stay home to take care of uh, their kids. My next recommendation would be if test optional isn't working and if test prep um, doesn't move scores, then let's stop looking into this. Let's focus somewhere else because it's actually harming the populations it's aiming to help. And to schools, I would say, clarify your expectations. It's really coy to say that you're a testing optional institution, but to not really say which populations you expect to test and not test. It also gives these underrepresented um, populations the impression that a school is easier to get into because you don't have to take a test. And that's not the case at all. So I'm asking schools to clarify a little bit better. And the last recommendation I have in this space is we need to do a better job of encouraging alternate paths to success that don't involve four-year colleges. You can de-emphasize the test by providing better alternatives. And this is a prescription for most real change, be it the use of gasoline cars or uh, getting people to stop smoking. You don't sort of just eliminate things wholesale. You give them better alternatives and increase their opportunity costs. So that's all I have for this presentation. I appreciate your time and listening. I'm gonna stop the share